Realm presents Tales Beyond Time, episode 24. Hello, fellow travelers, and welcome to Tales Beyond Time, presented by Realm. I'm Marco Palmieri, and I'm excited to take you on another amazing journey. This week, we're back with the thrilling conclusion of our two-part A.M. Della Monica special. I introduced you to A.M. last week, so without further ado, let's dive into part two of their alternate history of Joan of Arc, A Key to the Illuminated Heretic. Conversion at Orléans. In 1429, Joan led the troops that relieved the English siege of Orléans. Now, in 1450, the city's gates stand open to her and her convert. Joan is upright on a black stallion, brandishing an unlit torch. Behind her, the listener troops straggle, bleeding and in apparent despair. The townspeople are rapturous. Girls dressed as men beckon Joan, holding up the pieces of a full set of armor. Larks fill the sky, soaring on the town's high spirits. At the gate, four priests and the bishop of Orléans clutch at their throats. Folklore has it that the Catholic clergymen were struck dumb as they tried to convince the city fathers to close the gates to the Jeanists. The Ermelon Testament states unequivocally that they were merely shouted down and turned out of the town. Historians do agree that the listener movement would have died out without the support of Orléans at this critical juncture. Their army was ill-equipped and half-starved. The bourgeoisie of Orléans were mad for Dulice's illustrations of Joan. So wrote Marcel's papa anyway, in his monthly lament about the restrictions their dear maid was putting on the process of producing the paintings in quantity. The insistence on Latin for the inscriptions, the hard condition that the illustrators refrained from adding to Dulice's simple scenes, and the insulting requirement that he send each completed illustration back to be checked for inaccuracies. Meanwhile, Papa's competitors translated the Roman text back to proper French and threw in as many angels and ghouls as they chose. Yes, Papa. Yes, Papa. Marcel grinned, murmuring the words as if he was home, receiving the sermon personally. Is it my fault the maid is mad to keep her every stroke of fortune from being counted a miracle? A dozen copyists Papa had in his shop filling vellum and imported paper with portraits of the maid and her deeds. Their paintings might not be as lurid as their paymaster would wish, but they were bringing in plenty of gold. From Dulice's dirty and blood-stained originals, they made gloriously coloured pictures, bordered with silver flowers and bright stars. Their images of the maid were never old or plain enough to please a Joan who had come forth from prison, shorn of her pride and legendary boastfulness. That was a pity, in Marcel's opinion. It had given her a much-needed flair. If only she had lost her stubbornness instead. He winked at the wagon driver who'd brought in the supplies. It was Jean d'Arc, who was slipping back into his sister's penumbra after an exile stemming from a scheme so old neither of them remembered its details. Grinning furtively, Jean hefted a long, heavy satchel from underneath the sacks of grain. The sword. Marcel whispered, though the cool iron inside the fabric made the answer obvious. Sword and the other, Jean murmured, pulling his hat low over his eyes. Nobody's seen them. Dear Papa, he turns paper to gold and gold to food. Jean nodded, looking at the other wagons and the hard-driven horses that had caught them up to the army. And this time... Yes, this time. Caught in his reverie, Marcel was unpleasantly surprised to find Dulice at his side. Ah, the alchemist herself. Alchemy is witchcraft, she said. He bore her displeasure happily, since it gave Jean time to slouch away. Shall I call you our little Latin tutor, then? The one who somehow never teaches our maid any Latin? Most unfair, since we have to mouth it psalm by onerous psalm. She learns when she may, Dulice said. She prefers to study war. Who will she drive from France next, do you think, if we win? What do you study, Marcel, besides nonsense? Only the provisioning of our company, he pointed at the supplies. 
The finished pictures are in that wagon. If they portray the true doings of our maid, perhaps you would write to my father so he can spread our message. What's this? She poked his bundle, discerning no doubt the shape of the weapon within. Marcel did not blush. Gifts from home. Delise had only been in a convent two years, but she had the penetrating gaze of a mother superior. It had quite marred her. Despite the round body, cornflower eyes, and golden hair, she could never be a woman with whom a sane man would lie comfortably. Private gifts, he amended, but by now the damnable woman's fuss had summoned Joan. How did they manage it, this art of seeing the unseen? What is it? the maid asked peremptorily. The French Bible Ermelon mentioned? No such thing, Marcel said stoutly. There had been no time yet for anyone to translate, let alone copy such a book. Food for the army and paintings for you and Dulis to examine. Pretending he'd forgotten she was as unlettered as a farm animal, he showed her a scrap of vellum, Jean's inventory of papa's wagons. She battered it away and the mule was hard in her features. You must... A shriek from the east interrupted her. A girl ran towards them, one of the scouts coming from a distant Roman edifice called the Temple of Janus. Legs pumping in her britches, her pale face was a blot of white amid the landscape of green and brown. Hoofbeats beat behind her, a knight galloping in hard pursuit. Marcel felt rather than saw Joan's movement. He flung himself blindly at the nearest horse, just reaching its bridle as she mounted. No! Between them, they startled the animal into a kick. Joan lost her saddle and came off, landing half atop him. His arm jerked painfully before he thought to release the reins. As he hit the ground, the animal's back hooves whistled past their heads. The pair rolled away fast in opposite directions, gaining their feet in the same instant. You aren't even armed, he protested. Joan crossed the space between them, slapping Marcel hard enough to knock him down again, then calming the horse with a single murmured word. Rubbing his jaw, he saw Dulis was oblivious to both the animal and the fleeing girl headed toward them. Transfixed by Joan, the artist was memorizing the scene. No market for this, he wanted to tell her. Papa couldn't sell two copies of a picture of the maid striking a follower. Oh, now it's too late, Joan cried. The knight had indeed caught up with the fleeing scout. Instead of cutting her down, he snatched her by the arm, heaving her up across the horse and then galloping away. Captured, not killed, Marcel said, tasting blood as he probed loosened teeth with his tongue. He'll get another chance to save her. She ignored him, pacing like a caged dog and eyeing the bend in the road where the knight had vanished. That knight, do you know who he is? Who? He is the son of Georges de la Tremoille. Her voice was harsh as she spoke the name of the man who had probably prevented her ransom years before. Just when I think I've outlived all my old enemies, there's always someone new, isn't there? It's your gentle nature, Marcel muttered, earning himself a glare. Joan! Ermelon bustled to her side, glancing quizzically down at Marcel. Hortan has announced they are with us. The whole town's converted and the king's army demands they return their churches and souls to the priests of Rome. Charles has stopped vacillating. He'll burn anyone who resists. Joan scowled, scraping mud off the heels of her hands. We must go to Autun, Ermelon suggested. Their walls are strong, but the king has cannon enough to break them. Joan agreed. We will assess the town's defenses and leave them some help if need be. The army will place itself between autun and danger. We'll meet Charles soon, then. Ermelon spoke mildly, the old anarchist, as if he wasn't lusting after a little king's blood. She nodded, not hiding her pained expression, and waved him off towards one of the more reliable captains. Then she extended a hand to Marcel, yanking him to his feet. I'll see your gifts from home now. He didn't argue but reached for the bundle and unwrapped it carefully. Perhaps he might just slide out the sword. Reaching past him, Joan grabbed the wrappings and yanked them upward. Then she gasped. White boucassin, fringed with silk, unfolded in her mud-smeared hand. A pennant. 
It showed a field strewn with lilies and two angels on either side of the world. The words, Jesus Maria, blazed across it. I stand it. She pulled it to her face in a doubled fistful, and Marcel thought she would smell it, but she kissed it instead, tears streaming down her lined face as they so often did. I haven't seen it since my capture at Compiègne. She stretched it out for a look. It was perfect, faded, soiled, and then washed its fabric worn. Marcel waited, face a blank. Then Joan's face stilled and her tears dried up. He felt a pain like gas in his belly as her head turned, piercing him with the look an owl might use to freeze a field mouse. Where did you get this? Pretend ignorance and blame Papa? No, those eyes dragged forth the truth even from him. Hamish Powers lives yet. He remembers the original well. He made a copy, she said, dropping the banner like the corpse of a dog. She rubbed at her mouth, dirtying her lips, and then she dumped the satchel from Orléans with one violent heave. The sword dropped out. It was a replica of the holy blade she had broken over a whore's back all those years before. Marcel, what are you up to? He swallowed. I thought, if Charles saw you with your pennant restored, your broken sword whole, you would stage a miracle. Marcel could see she was on the verge of throwing him away and all Papa's resources with him. Have you no faith at all? I confess my mistake, he said, forcing himself to look down. I want to help by doing wrong. I'm sorry. Each humble word was singed by the rage rising in his throat. If she would just allow them to read the Bible in French. I want to bring the king to our side, that's all. You must try harder to believe. A silence then, while he looked at his toes and endured the stares of common soldiers who lurked at the sidelines. Intolerable after all he had done, but he tolerated it. At length, the maid sighed. But you are confessed, and I forgive you. Relief flooded him, and he dared a glance up. Joan was testing the sword's weight without realizing it, raising it in that dangerous way of hers, so the point was aimed at his throat. Then suddenly she smiled. Nobody will mistake this for the original. That had five crosses, and this has three. With that, she slid it into her scabbard. Marcel indicated the banner, still lying on the ground. And this? Burn it. She spared the pennant, not a glance. The lark banner will do good service tomorrow. Jump, for this time we are with you. Joan, in full armor, leaps from a burning church steeple. Saints Catherine and Margaret grasp her arms, bearing her slowly to the ground. Below, Jeanne's soldiers watch in wonder. It is interesting to note that the original Dulis Allon sketch for this plate has survived and is available for comparison with the final Orléans illumination. The sketch calls for columns of smoke from the church fire to surround Joan's body and makes no mention of the saints. It also notes that Joan's foot should be bare and bloodied, but does not say what this signifies. The inscription, it is generally agreed, indicates Joan had achieved a renewed state of grace by the time of this dangerous leap. In a 1430 attempt to escape her English captors, Joan jumped from the 60-foot tower at Beaurevoir. Though she survived, the escape attempt failed. She said later that her voices had told her not to jump. They were moving to it at long last and after so much waiting for a decisive battle, Ermelond should have been relieved. Instead, he was too aware of his mount. His old horse, Rust, had been lamed in the skirmish the day before. He'd found him limping this morning, favoring a bloodied pastin. The young black stallion he rode now was poorly trained, fighting the bit and trying to crop grass every chance he got. They moved with deadly purpose, racing past Autant. By meeting Charles beyond the town, they left themselves a place of retreat. If it came to that, though, they and Autant would probably come to ruin. 
It won't come to that, he thought. They had won small victories before, and now they would show their strength and the righteousness of their cause. As they neared the walls, they spied a band of soldiers scouting its gates, a force so small it fled at their approach. The knight, De La Tremorie, who had captured their scout, was the last to retreat, turning twice to glare at Joan before galloping away. Nearer the cheering town, they found the scout herself. She was lying in a shallow stream, with just her head and shoulders on the bank. Blood ran from her mouth. Shooting a murderous look at Marcel, Joan dismounted. Someone else can give her last rites, Ermelon said, and then regretted it. It would take but a few minutes. What was the difference? She's breathing, Joan said indignantly. And she was, he saw. The maid bent, murmuring prayers, the sun glinting off her silver hair as she dipped a hand in the stream and rinsed blood off the scout's pale face. It roused the girl. She coughed, spraying red droplets over her own wet chin. Have her carried to town, Joan ordered. She lifted the injured girl, straining to raise the slack body and water-sodden clothes as well as her own armor-weighted limbs. Two young men-at-arms and one of the fighting women rushed to relieve her of the burden. There was a receding bustle, and then they were underway again. It was a warm, sleepy day. The sky was dotted with small clouds, and a firm wind cooled the lances, ensuring a steady and comfortable march. Despite the tussles with his horse, Ermelon scanned the edges of the army for a blonde head. Dulis must not come near the fighting again. She could have been killed or captured yesterday, up on that hill in plain sight with her pen and ink bottle. The thought brought a rush of confused feelings. Pain, desire, fear for her safety, and a wistful longing. He shoved it all aside. The girl would never leave Joan, and that meant she would remain unmarried and chaste. Unless they won, there was no point in wondering if the artist might take a once monk to wed. No point either if they lost. But he would not think of that. At length, they reached a floodplain run through on one side by a shallow river that must have been the Aru. Larks nested in the grass by the water. On the other side of this plain was the glittering army of Charles the Seventh. Ermelon felt a small flutter in his belly, a feeling like hunger that was really just shock. No word from the other scouts, he thought numbly. They must all be dead or captured. The two forces halted well out of bow range, weighing each other. The Jeannist army seemed tiny and tired in comparison to the company arrayed across the field. Ermelon thought of the battle the day before, the listener numbers overwhelming its foe easily, even when the camp had been unprepared for a fight. Finally, the silence grew too long. Clearing his throat, he spoke. The king has more knights and better weapons. Marcel laughed. What a great and unnecessary understatement. Here's another, then. We have God, Joan said, staring at the king. Her voice was threadbare. Here was the real army he had wanted to fight for so long. What arrogance. For the first time, Ermelond appreciated Joan's tactics, how she had kept them on the move as she trained the men, why she had always chosen the smaller battles, the most defensible towns. There might have been 5,000 men out there across the valley, well-drilled, well-fed, and fresh. Should we advance? he asked. Or let them charge. I always advance, Joan said. But a movement to their left brought his head around. Dulis Olan was edging towards a low rock, no doubt thinking to crouch behind it and record the carnage. Joan's gaze followed his. Dulis, she called. The girl startled. Then she headed toward them as if she'd meant to come that way all along. Get to the rear, woman. Ermelond growled. She ignored him. Joan, please, I must see what is going on. We will tell you everything later. That's no good. Blonde brows drew into a fierce scowl. They're already saying there has been a miracle here. I can't draw rumors. I must see. What miracle? Joan raised her visor. Marcel? He puffed up indignantly. 
Am I to be accused of fraud every time God is kind to us? It's not true, Delise, Ermelon said. We've been riding together all morning. I'm sure I'd have noticed the hand of God if it came down and pointed our way. Please go before you're trampled. Delise's bright eyes sought out Jones, unrelenting. Her back was stiff with determination. They're saying our scout was dead, and you raised her. They could charge any second, Ermelon interrupted. Dulis is unarmed and on foot. Our own soldiers will run her over if battles joined. Your brothers are in the camp, spreading tales, the artist protested. This is what you want me to prevent. Joan, Ermelon said. Please, she'll be killed. Joan sighed. Marcel, bear Dulis to the rear. Order my brothers turned out of the company. No, protested Dulis. The fight is upon us, Joan. Surely I'm needed. Yes, Marcel, needed at the rear. Her voice was iron. And please, tell everyone the scout was alive. Sulking, Marcel drew Dulis up onto the horse, seating her in front of him. She had to flap her arms, bird-like, to balance her drawing board and papers without losing them to the wind. Ermelon sighed, and the knot in his belly untied itself. She would be safe with Marcel. And now, will you advance? He asked the maid again. Yes. With a brisk move, Joan plucked her banner from the standard bearer. And you will charge too, Ermelon, if this falls, not before. He knew what she would do. You think Charles won't kill you now? That sick old man left you to the church once already. It would be a miracle if you made it back. Her voice was furious. Everything I do is a miracle, haven't you heard? I'll speak to the king one more time. No attack unless this falls. Do you hear? And if they take it from you? Destroy them, she said carelessly. Banner held high on its ash shaft. Joan urged her white horse forward at a walk. A whisper ran through the army. Ermelon heard its echo, a surprised rise and fall of voices from across the valley. Then lark song was all he could hear. The maid rode well beyond his protection. Twenty feet, fifty, a hundred. Soon she was across the field, and even the birds fell silent. Ermelon realized he was praying. Marcel had not ridden a step. He wasn't ignoring orders. He was simply stuck, staring at Joan with the frozen expression of a man who expects to see disaster. So did they all, all except Dulis. She was twisted awkwardly on his horse, writing board pressed into a stomach, thumb mashing a page to its surface while she scratched with her pen as if possessed. When Joan was twenty feet from the enemy army, she dismounted. Banner raised, she slapped her horse's rump. The animal loped straight to Ermelon, eyes reproachful. She is all alone now, it seemed to say. Beyond rescue. Perhaps we could steal forward a little, Marcel murmured. Dulise paused in her drawing just long enough to crane around, giving him a look that would sour milk. There's no saving her now if he strikes. And no saving him if he harms her, Ermelon said. His voice challenged Marcel to laugh, to point out the odds were against them. Instead, he heard his own words spreading like fire, warming the gathered men as Dulise's eyes met his with a jolt. The gusty air around them seemed to thicken. If the battle came, Joan's men would make it an expensive one. Marcel had become a knight, Dulis an artist, he a general. The listeners had been transubstantiated from a band of cross-bearing bandits into a true army through God's grace. Now, perhaps, their day had come. He was strangely content to wait and see. Across the field, Joan of Arc knelt before her king. Wedding in the Loire. A young couple kneels before an outdoor worship assembly. The girl's white dress befits the occasion, but her lowered head and expression speak of a grief that is absent from the face of the groom. Joan and a group of well-wishers stand to the right bearing farewell gifts, 
food, and travel necessities. Despite attempts to place this image after Autant, and to claim it as the wedding of Brother Ermelond and the martyr Dulis Olon, the evidence clearly favors another interpretation. A crossbow sits in easy reach of the bride's hand, marking her as a member of the army. Further, the forbidden marriage, as it is known, took place in secret, so that Joan, who demanded chastity from her female followers, would not be faced with turning the no longer chaste Dulis out of the listener ranks. It was cold up there at the front line, drawing with a board wedged against her belly and Ermelon's concern sending chills through her bones. Dulis drew anyway. A quick image of the maid raising the banner, her orders written in French. No time for translation now. Then a figure of her riding toward the king covered with more notes. Horse does not gallop. Wind strong. Banner fully extended. And now, on one knee before old Charles, her neck bent. Dulise had to squint to make her out clearly. When she did, fear pushed the breath out of her in a moan, even as her hand shakily unstoppered her ink bottle, spilling black drops onto the neck of Marcel's cream-colored horse. A motion from the king and Joan rose, bending backwards stiffly so she could look up at him. Clad in armor, the distant figures gave no clue as to their mood. They might as well have been statues. Dolls. What do you think she's saying? Marcel asked. What else but the usual? Ermelon's voice was reverent. The Lord God wants me to drive the corrupt church out of France. Stand down or die. She wouldn't say that to Charles. She'll say anything, Ermelon said. Will she do it? That's the question. The men's voices were faint, far away. Delise pressed a new page to her writing board, inking her pen to draw the maid standing in front of the vast array of armed men, so small and alone against the force of Charles. Now the king doll was shaking his head so stiffly his shoulders moved with him. Joan bowed again, turning on her heel and starting back. Her gait, angry steps Dulis knew well, said the parley had not gone well. She still held the banner aloft. When she was halfway across the plain, De La Tremoille could contain himself no longer. He spurred his mount and galloped after her, a charge of one. Both armies jerked forward. Shouts from Ermelande and Charles VII cracked across the field and the twin advances halted raggedly. Marcel's armored hands tightened around Dulis, jostling her pen so that a thick black line scratched across Joan's figure. I'm safe, she said furiously, but Marcel wasn't listening. Raising her eyes from the page, Dulis saw the knight bearing down on Joan. Her safe world of picture-making burned away, and she screamed. Joan had needed no warning, she did not draw her sword, just turned with her banner and waited for him to come. The knight twirled a flail overhead, swinging as he galloped past her. The blow struck hard, its crunch sending another shock through the army. It lifted Joan off her feet. She landed on her back and did not move. Ermelon's armor creaked as he raised his hand to signal a charge. But the lark banner did not fall. It remained in Joan's hand as she lay there, dead for all anyone knew. The staff that held the standard remained perfectly upright. Wiping her nose, Dulise pressed her pen against the page. She drew Joan, lying beside the banner. Her eyes were wide and she could hear herself sobbing. She turned her head whenever a tear fell to keep it from further smearing the ink. Brother, Marcel said breathlessly, but Ermelon did not signal a charge. He moved his head slightly and a girl archer stepped forward, firing an arrow at the knight as he wheeled back to Joan. The shaft caught his horse, striking it in the haunch. The animal screamed and danced sideways, forcing the knight to dismount. Raising his weapon, he strode toward the fallen maid. She moves! A cry went through one army, perhaps both. Joan sat bolt upright and then stood, as if it were no effort at all as if she were wearing nothing heavier than a nightgown. Her hand fell away from the standard pole as she drew her sword. Again, the banner did not waver. 
and that was wrong. The wind blew still, strong enough to unfurl it fully, and yet it stood upright as if planted deep in the ground. Perhaps it is, Dulys thought. Perhaps Joan's weight as she fell drove it into the soil. But the ground is dry and hard, she said, not sure who she was asking. Isn't it? The knight looped his flail up, bringing it down towards the maid's head. She skipped back uncommonly fast and raised her free arm in defence. The chain wrapped around her wrist. Metal screeched against metal and Marcel hissed as if in pain. Around her pen, Dulisa's fingers were white. The knight yanked on his flail, but Joan did not fall. She jerked her captured arm backward sharply, closing her fingers around the handle of the flail and pulling it from her attacker's grip. Her sword was at the ready, but Joan, she drove the butt of the flail against De La Tremoille's helmet, once, twice. The blows were so loud, they echoed back from the other side of the meadow. The knight staggered back a few paces. Turn aside. I would not fight today. Her words rang across the field. Bellowing, the knight charged. Joan was ready. She drove the sword home, piercing De La Tremoille's collar with shocking force. The man crumpled without making another sound. Turning her back on the body, Joan marched lightly back to where her standard was waiting. She lifted it as easily as if she took it from a waiting herald. The ground is dry, Dulis, Marcel whispered urgently. You must write of this. Joan told me yesterday the Lark Banner would. Now of all times? Dulis twisted, furious, trying to see Marcel to stare him down. I'm telling you, don't speak to me. She slid down from the horse and lost her last clean page to the wind. Marcel snapped his mouth shut. Then he turned his horse. Where are you going? Ermelon asked. To expel Jean d'Arc from the army. Dooley stared, dismayed at her inkwet paper. It would smudge if she turned it over now. Were the other page lost, she would have to draw miniatures next to the image of the maid on her back. When Joan had almost reached her army, she turned to face the king. Tearing off her surcoat, she revealed the bare, crumpled armour over her heart. Then she raised her open hand, apparently indifferent to the flail caught in the joint of her gauntlet. The whole of the listener army strained against its leash. But one by one, the gold-crossed flags in Charles's army fell to the ground. Soon, only the king's personal banner remained upright on the other side of the field. Joan lowered her own hand slowly and turned to face the troops. Save your strength. We will not fight the king. Dooley scribbled the words in the margin of the picture as the army gentled. We're going to win, Ermelon said softly. Charles will ride with us. With God, Joan said. A smile twitched at the corner of his mouth. And in Latin, too. She nodded looking at the crushed, blood-weeping gauntlet. I don't think I can get this off. The flail's stuck and it's all bent. We'll see to it, Ermelon slid to the ground, holding out the reins of her horse and offering to help her mount. Thank you, Joan said, passing the staff and flag to her herald as she mounted. She reined the horse awkwardly with her good hand, her path taking her right past Dulis. Her shadow fell on the hodgepodge of ink on that last page. You've made me too brave again, she said, but she smiled, and Elise felt her whole soul open up. Had she once had reservations? Not she. She would be here with the maid and Ermelon forever. She would blaze the truth of their fight, its small wonders and the miracles that weren't, that were just good fortune and life's merciful accidents. Her drawing was God's work indeed, not false pride. Could she ever have doubted? But what of that, she said, pointing to the lark banner. How will I show that so nobody says it was a miracle? It stood when you fell. It stood when you walked away. An impish, youthful smile crossed the maid's face. What was it you said? If it's truth, then it should be made known, Diddy said. She fought back a tremble in her voice. Good, sensible advice, 
Ermelon said, and his tone was warm. Just give us whatever you see, Dulis. Spurring her horse, Joan rode, bleeding in the direction of Autun. Wet-eyed but with a steady hand, Dulis scratched out the maid's instructions word by word in Latin, filling up the last clear space remaining on her page with bold letters and certain words. Three Miracles at Autun Gauntlet raised, Joan stands between the supine figure of an armored girl and the corpse of a knight. A stylized puddle of water surrounds the girl, who takes up the largest part of the center of the page. Blood seeps from the knight's armor, and the two fluids mix at Joan's feet. One of the most confusing and controversial images of the Jeannist holy war, Three Miracles is said to depict holy works by Joan that convince the famously indecisive Charles to throw his favor to the maid's cause. The first miracle was defeating Georges de la Tremouille in single unarmed combat. The second was the resurrection of the girl, who had been drowned by de la Tremouille earlier that day. As usual, attempts have been made to identify the girl as Joan's favorite, Dulis Olon. It is far more probable that the figure is her standard bearer, for Olon was neither a combatant nor given to self-portraiture. Further, the woman holds the lark banner. Despite the title of the image, the nature of any third miracle to take place at Autun in the spring campaign of 1456 has been lost to history. It's a strange thing when an alternate history story debates within itself the importance of recording truth. And yet somehow, A.M. Delamonico, with words both thrilling and poignant, makes it possible not just for us to accept that paradox, but to embrace it. Ready for your next adventure? Check out Bullet Catcher. In an alternate Wild West, a young woman in search of her lost brother becomes hell-bent on acquiring the power to catch bullets. Or you might enjoy The Shadow Files of Morgan Knox. It's 1933, and an Afro-Latina PI in Manhattan can see the darkness coming, but she may not be able to stop it. Both shows are out now and available wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, whatever dimension you're in, safe travels. You're listening to Tales Beyond Time, created and produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Tales Beyond Time, episode 24, features a key to the illuminated heretic, written by A.M. Delamonica. It is produced by Mary Asadolahi and Marco Palmieri, associate produced by Alexis Latshaw, and executive produced by Molly Barton, hosted by Marco Palmieri, and performed by Sharomi Arcerio and Matt Godfrey. Audio produced by Spoken Realms. Additional editing by Nicholas Papaleo. Cover art by Kendall Thomas.